All right, so John 14, Proverbs 9, Ephesians 2. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, I thank you again for the privilege of being here this day. I thank you, Lord, that you have put each of us exactly where we are. By your sovereign knowledge, you have done this. By your great wisdom, you have blessed us in this way. Lord, I so look forward to what you're going to do next. Lord, I pray that I would always, always remember to bless you. That my soul, my very deepest parts would bless you, Lord. Lord, as it says in Psalm 103, that all that is within me would seek to bless you. You're the one that deserves all blessing, all glory, and all honor because of the wonderful God that you are, the holy God that you are, that you are the Lord of lords and the King of kings and the God of gods. You are over all and above all, Lord. You are so truly wonderful. Lord, I pray that I would never forget to bless you and to forget all the benefits that you have given, that I would daily be thankful to you, even for the next breath that I have. I need to be thankful for that, that I have that I have legs, that I can stand, that I have shoes on my feet. Lord, I pray I would never forget to bless you for that. And God, I thank you because you do forgive my iniquities. I thank you, Lord, that you want us to come to you and repent of our sins. And you are faithful and just and forgive those sins. And Lord, you heal us. You have redeemed us. And Lord, you have done so much for us. And I pray now that this message would bless you. I pray your son, Jesus Christ, would be exalted and lifted up. And I pray, Lord that daily we would be grateful and thankful to you. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. John chapter 14, pretty simple. Go to verse 27. John chapter 14, verse 27. John 14, 27. And Jesus Christ is speaking and he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And the peace of Jesus Christ far surpasses anything that the world ever possibly could provide. At best, the world provides a counterfeit peace, a manufactured peace, a peace that is fleeting, a peace that ultimately provides little comfort. Think about people with addictions for a moment. Why do they have the addiction? Because they are trying to change something in their life or they are trying to hide from something in their life. Perhaps they cannot handle a situation and the addiction gives them a respite from whatever the issue is. But they are only compounding the problem because the addiction becomes one more issue in their lives. And furthermore, they know that the addiction is a problem, but now they are hooked and they cannot stop the addiction. So the peace the addiction gives them also gives them more troubles in the end because the peace does not last and each time the addiction is indulged 
the peace lasts a shorter and shorter amount of time. The addiction has become an idol in that person's life, and idolatry requires a lot of work by the idolater to keep the idol happy, so to speak. The idolatry of addiction can include anything. It could include drug use, alcohol use, which are two things people usually think of with addictions. Addictions are the fruit of the flesh as listed in Galatians 5, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. An addiction isn't anything, is anything that you crave and want more than anything else. It truly is idolatry because the addiction has replaced the Lord God of heaven as what is most important to you. Furthermore, addictions can be video games and cell phones. I have read of violence being committed by people that have had their cell phones taken from them and of people that have sit at video games so long that their health becomes endangered. A few years back in Korea, they have like these video game parlors where they just sit and play these games. And there was one that just sat there for days playing this game, never got up, never ate. He died. What a foolish thing to die over. How sad a life that addictions can do that to you. Furthermore, addictions can be social media, as people enjoy seeing what salacious things are happening in other people's lives, and as people desperately seek clicks and likes on their Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok pages. Addictions can be television shows, movies, books, sports. Addictions can include shopping, online shopping, and shoplifting. Addictions can be people, spouses, girlfriends, or boyfriends, relatives, children, grandchildren, and even complete strangers. Addictions can be the foods you eat, the drinks you drink, and the things that you smoke or chew. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, one of David's sons, Amnon, lusted for his half-sister, Tamar. She became an idol to him, and it says that she was a vexation. She had no idea. And she had not done anything to entice Amnon, but his idolatry of her grew and grew where he became sick over it. Eventually, at the advice, bad advice of a friend, he faked being sick and asked his father, David, if he would send Tamar to, pre to prepare some food for him. She came and she prepared food. He lured her into the bedroom and then he forced himself upon her to her great objection. And after he was done, his idolatry finished of her because he then hated her and he sent her away. Which really was still an idolatry. It just changed its direction. The addiction and the idolatry had consumed Amnon and his reasoning. And Amnon's addiction began in the thoughts and intents of the heart long before they were ever acted upon. And what we must understand is that addictions and idolatry do not happen overnight. Addictions and idolatry start even before a person samples the idol. Keep your finger in John 14. Go over to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Go down to verse 13. Proverbs 9 verse 13. Proverbs 9, verse 13. 
A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house, on a seat in the high places of the city, to call passengers who go right on their ways. Who, whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Solen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. The addiction and idolatry is like the foolish woman in Proverbs chapter 9. The idol is simple and knows little but how to entice someone to sample its wares. By being clamorous, it calls out to you, attempting to draw you into its snares and cause you to fall down in worship to the idol eventually. She is clamorous and noisy, calling out to those that pass by and inviting them into her house. The addiction sits at the door and on a seat or a throne of high places or authority. And because of where she is, people are more likely to listen. Think about people that have smoked. My dad smoked, my mother smoked for many, many, many years. And, and how did he start? It wasn't because he just suddenly walked over into a store and picked up a pack of cigarettes and started smoking. You know, he played tennis in high school and college and was quite good at it, but still smoked, which wouldn't help. But what did he do? He was influenced by friends around him. He was influenced by you know, television programming back then. You know, all the TV shows were sponsored quite often by cigarettes and, and, and radio shows and, and, and such. It wasn't like he just suddenly decided one day, oh, I'm going to take up smoking. That's how an addiction starts. It starts slow. His friends were smoking. And so he joined in. They offered him one one day. And it was an addiction that lasted a long, long time. Thankfully, over the last uh, three, four years, he had stopped, which was good. But addictions never just suddenly spring upon you and you're addicted. It's always slow and it builds up. You're drawn into it. Something calls to you and says, hey, be like us. You know, just like as the clamorous woman, she's sitting at the door of her house and on a seat in the higher places of the city and she's calling out to people. The addiction does the same thing. It'll call out to people and say, be like us, be cool, be hip, be smart. This will do wonderful things for you. But it never does. Consider today, many people think that celebrities are authorities on many, many subjects simply because they are actors and have been seen on television or movies. Because of their worldwide exposure, people will listen to them. However, they too are like the clamorous woman who is simple and knoweth nothing. And because of social media, Many people believe themselves to be experts on anything and will willingly tell you so. The addiction calls out to everyone, and not all will answer, but those that are simple to the ways of the addiction will turn in hither. The addiction or idol promises, sto verse 17, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. The clamorous woman offers the simple bread and water, the very basics for those that are hungry and thirsty. And what happens is that the offering of bread and water is made more enticing to the simple because they are stolen waters and the bread is eaten in secret. It's like, shh, this is our little secret. Don't tell anyone. I think that's often what happens with those that shoplift. Just from personal experience of seeing it, you know, that, that there's a, a buzz of knowing you got away with something. I think 
the basic bread and water is made exciting because of the chance of being discovered. There is an element of risk. And isn't that a part of addictions quite often? It is something that is forbidden or taboo. So the addict gets a rush thinking they have gotten around those in authority or they have fooled others. But because it is something that is not supposed to be had, the thought of fooling someone else or the thought of having something that is supposed to be unattainable or illegal is exciting to the eventual addict and idolater. Because of our sin nature, we are prone to that which is forbidden. We just naturally want to rebel because our hearts are rebellious and are naturally drawn to the works of the flesh. And there is a consequence for our rebellious hearts. Verse 18. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Think about it. How often does anyone ever consider the consequences of sin, the addiction, the idolatry, before indulging in it? What happens is the mind thinks about the sin itself. The man or woman is enticed or drawn to the sin, and it ultimately becomes all they think about as they go through the day and night. And the temptation draws them to the sin, and their lust begins for the sin. And then the sin is brought forth, and when it is finished, the sin brings death. Physical death and or spiritual death. Matthew Henry wrote of this passage in Proverbs 9, Her guests that are treated with those stolen waters are not only in the highway to hell and at the brink of it, but they are already in the depths of hell under the power of sin, led captive by Satan at his will, and ever and anon lashed by the terrors of their own consciences, which are a hell upon earth. The depths of Satan are the depths of hell. Remorseless sin is remedyless sin. Ru I'm sorry. Remorseless sin is remedyless ruin. It is the bottomless pit already. And what is sad in all of this is that there is a better way. But too many refuse it because they would much rather seek the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life rather than the spiritual things of God. Go up now to the beginning of chapter 9. Go up to verse 1. Proverb 9, verse 1. Proverb 9, verse 1. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. Wisdom, which is personified by Jesus Christ in Proverbs chapter 8, has built a house for the feast that is provided. Nothing is done in secret. Nothing is stolen. The food being offered is meat and wine, far, far better than stolen bread and water. Wisdom is provided and furnished the table, something the foolish woman will not do. Jesus Christ has offered you something far better than the foolish woman could ever provide. Jesus Christ offers life and peace to those that follow him. Nothing in secret, nothing stolen, nothing illegal. Addictions and idolatry only feed the flesh and offer no benefits to the user. You must realize that. And this is what we must lovingly share with those that are caught up in addictions. Look at verse 3. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Wisdom calls out to everyone. There are no secrets with the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Wisdom calls out to the simple. For those that come to Jesus Christ as a little child, 
will be able to dine with him. So many want to go in under their own power, under their own mindset, thinking they can do things their way. We need to come to him as a little child, innocent, trusting him, fully trusting him. You know, when, when I was able to, to walk my grandson a little bit, you know, because he can't walk yet, you know, and, and so I bend over and, and he would take my hands, my, my fingers, and he would walk in front of me. What was he doing? He fully trusted me that I was going to walk him wherever he wanted to go, but just walk him. He didn't expect that I would kick him or, or potentially drop him or anything like that. He fully trusted me. That's how we're to come to Christ. Trusting him. Not thinking, oh, what if he... He won't. We can trust Christ. We don't have to question it. That's what he means by come to me as a little child. And we need to shout this out for people to hear. They need to wake up. They need to come and dine with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the bread of life, everlasting life. We need people to see why sit there with your stolen waters and your meager secret bread that will never satisfy or bring you peace. His is the bread that comes down from heaven so that a man may eat thereof and never die. Jesus Christ offers a bountiful feast. Why sit there with your half-frozen microwave dinner? Repent of your sins. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trust in him who was tempted in all ways, but never once sinned. Verse 6. <clears throat> Forsake the foolish and live. Go in the way of understanding. Now that word forsake means to quit entirely, to desert, to abandon. And that is how it is with an addiction. You must forsake it and never return to it. Cast it far away and never seek to bring it back into your life. Repent of the addiction and pray to God the Lord for forgiveness. And then live and walk in the way of understanding, in the way of the Lord in the way of his steps, in the way of truth, in the way of his commandments, in the way of righteousness, which is life, in the way of holiness, in the way of salvation. The only lasting way to be free from addictions is through Jesus Christ. People can try all kinds of man-made programs and programs that refer of whatever religious conviction that you may or may not have, like AA talks of, you know, go to that higher being, that higher power. That higher power is Jesus Christ. He has a name. Believe on him, not some higher nebulous unknown thing. Jesus Christ is knowable. We can know him and we can love him, and we can serve him. Go to him. All right, go back over to John 14. We're set in um, Proverbs. John chapter 14, again, verse 27. And Jesus Christ, he's speaking with his apostles. And he says here in verse 27 again, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now Jesus Christ is talking to his apostles. Judas Iscariot has left the room to go and betray Jesus Christ at the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Jesus Christ tells the disciples that he has given them peace and he is leaving it with them. Jesus Christ will give you his peace and he does not pull it away at a random moment. He leaves the peace with you. And what happens when you have no peace? Because you left the peace of Jesus Christ behind as you chased after your worryings and your frettings. You left his peace behind while you sought comfort elsewhere. You left his peace behind as you tried to rely on your own wisdom and understanding. You left his peace behind when the fear of the Lord left you and you became more afraid of man. Do not worry about tomorrow, for Jesus Christ has it well in hand. Do not worry about today, because Jesus Christ has it all in, under control. And as he said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Go back up to the beginning of chapter 14, verse 1. And there you see the wonderful promise for those that have repented and believed the gospel. Chapter 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. He says it here at the beginning, and he says it again at verse 27. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. Now this is a passage that is, of course, very popular at funerals. However, this is not a promise to those that wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ during their time here on earth. Jesus Christ did not prepare a place in his father's house for those that have rejected Jesus Christ or those that denied him or those that followed false gods. There is a different place that's been prepared for them and it is into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. They do not have a place waiting for them in heaven. It is a false comfort being provided. And those that are not born again rely by, are relying on stolen waters and secret bread for their comfort. They are told that they can bypass the door, the door of the sheepfold, and climb over the wall like a thief and a robber. Jesus Christ is the door. There is no other way except through him. For the believer, for the disciple of Jesus Christ who remains steadfast in his word and continues in his word, Jesus Christ tells you to not let your heart be troubled. Believe God. Believe Jesus Christ. You can truly trust him and know that his word is true. He alone can make you free if you will trust him. And he has prepared a place for you. What a glorious place it will be. Nothing around here can compare to it. The king, the king had it built for you and he has given you the deed. And Jesus Christ, the King, promises that where I am, there ye may be also. He is your refuge and your fortress. He is there with you. How can you be troubled except that you and I forget it? And in verse 4, Jesus Christ stated, And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. If you are a born-again child of God, you know where Jesus Christ went, and you know the way. The apostles have been told by Jesus Christ that he was going to Jerusalem to die. He told them that he was going to be lifted up for all to see, 
signifying how Jesus Christ was going to die. You know, even all the way back at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 3, 4, um, 2, one of the first, I'm sorry which chapter it is, but he says of how the temple is going to be raised, knocked down, and it's going to be raised up again. And John even writes that Jesus Christ was referring to himself. I apologize that I don't have the right chapter in my head right now. Jesus Christ even had told them he was going to come back. That Jesus Christ was going to die and then resurrect from the dead on the third day. The apostles had been told these things, so they knew, but they did not grasp and hold on to these promises yet. And how often do you and I forget to remind yourself of the gospel? How often do you forget that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? No man can ever come to the Father except through Jesus Christ, ever. Verse 27 again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus Christ gives you peace, and his peace is far different from what the world offers you. The world believes that if you have enough money, you will have peace. The world believes that if you have fame, you will have peace. The world believes that if you have everything you ever wanted, you will have peace. The world, I'm sorry, the peace that the world offers is addictive and idolatrous and covetousness. It is never enough and it is never satisfying. And you look at so many, don't do it, but you look at so many of the TV shows that are on right now in, in the afternoons, and, and people go to these, these hosts, and they think they'll be able to resolve whatever conflict I have. You know, I don't get along with this person or that person, or, or this person mistreats me, or that mis person mistreats me. And what ends up happening on so many of these shows these people come out, and it's almost like a bull out of the chute at a rodeo. They're, they're bucking, and they're yelling, and they're pointing fingers. Nothing gets solved in any of that. There's no peace. There's no life in any of that. But it's done for the world's entertainment, and that's the peace that the world offers. To make a prop of you and just show you to the world and laugh and mock. How sad. There's a better way. It's Jesus Christ. I right, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2, go down to verse 14. Keeping in mind what I had just read. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In verse 14 in Ephesians 2. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Jesus Christ is our peace. He is your peace. Because he is the mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ broke down the wall of partition. Jesus Christ is the one that reconciles man with God. But only when man believes on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one that is not born again will not be reconciled unless they repent and believe. Now continuing the sentence started there in verse 14, verse 15 having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. So, making peace, Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross, paying the wages of your sin and my sin, and by his death, burial, and resurrection, he reconciles believing, repentant man with God. Jesus Christ makes peace for you. Peace between you and God. That's the idea of reconciliation. 
you, you, again, you see these shows and they think, oh, we're going to bring everybody back together. I imagine when they leave, they're still arguing and bickering. Nothing got solved. Dr. Phil and Oprah are not God. They will never solve anything. Only Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the one that's going to bring peace between you and God. Beforehand, you were under God's wrath and condemnation, and you were with no peace and no hope. But praise God, Jesus Christ provided the way of life and peace. Verse 16, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. You are no longer the enemy of God. Jesus Christ is giving you peace, wonderful peace. Please do not let your heart be troubled. Please do not let your heart be afraid. Jesus Christ provides peace to you that is beyond the understanding of the world. We need to draw near to him and stay near to him. That is the message of hope that we have to give to those that are troubled and weary. That is the message of peace that we have to those that are in addictions and idolatries. There's no solution other than Jesus Christ. And it's not a case of, you've tried everything else, why not try God? It's awful. Just go to Jesus Christ. Humbly. Repent and believe on him. Because there is no peace without him. His is the only peace that will last. We need to stay close to him and draw near to him. That's the way a refuge works. A refuge doesn't do you any good if you're outside of it. And I know I've said that a lot, but it's so true. I need to remind myself of that. A fortress only works if you're inside the fortress. There is peace with Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to get across to people. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word. And I thank you, Lord, that your word is so concise, so wonderful, that I am able to to pull passages from three different parts of the Bible, and they all fit so well together. That's because of you, not because of what a man has done or what I have done. That's because of you. And God, I thank you for that. I am so grateful that you saved me. I am so thankful that you are near. And you never leave me, and you never forsake me. And you never forsake your children. Lord, there's so many that are hurting, so many that they know they need help. They don't know where that help is. And there's so many that know the help is from you, but they're still determined to go their own way. And they're just going to fall into that ditch. Lord, you know the time is short. And we know our days on this earth are short. And I pray we would make the most of them. I pray that we would not let our hearts be troubled. And we would rest in the peace that Jesus Christ gives us. And we would show that to others. And even more so, we would tell it to others. Yours is the gospel of peace. We need to get on our feet and share it with others. Lord, I thank you again. 
And all this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.